Good morning. I'm going to take a minute to introduce Mike Dickey this morning. He's a manager of Arrow Rock Historic Site and two satellite facilities, Sappington Cemetery and Boone's Lick State Historic Sites, units of the Missouri State Park System. Arrow Rock has been designated a National Historic Monument by the National Park Service, and Mike has oversight of eight historic structures dating from the 19th century, most notably the J. Houston Tavern, my favorite place, 1834, and the George Calum Bigham Home, 1837. He is a researcher and interprets cultural themes of the central Missouri region, historically known as Boone Slick County, our country, including Native American populations, Osage, Missouri, Iowa, Sac, and Fox Nations. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I always have a disclaimer when I, when I talk about American Indians because everybody will ask me at the end of the presentation if I, if I am. Oh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not an Osage, uh, but I've had connections with the Osage tribe going back to 1982. And uh, I also have connections with the uh, Odo, Missouri, and, and Iowa. So some of the things that I talk about when I talk about them are things that you just don't pick up in a book. You learn it from talking to elders and so forth. So there's a little bit of that that will uh, uh, come out in the presentation. I got my obligatory Missouri State Park slide, so <laughs> there. But we're going to talk about trade and trepidation, the relationship of the Osage Nation to Spanish St. Louis, which also includes St. Genevieve, really. Um, and this is the uh, uh, of course, that was the flag of, of Spain during the latter half of their uh, reign of Louisiana Territory. That is the Osage spider life symbol, so I just thought it would be a, kind of a good contrast uh, as far as the politics go. Um, <clears throat> President Thomas Jefferson met with a delegation of Osage leaders in Washington, D.C in July of 1805 and following the meeting he said the truth is they are the great nation south of the Missouri their possession extending from thence to the Red River as the Sioux are great north of that river with these two powerful nations we must stand well because in their quarter we are miserably weak while the Osage were the largest and most highly organized uh, tribe immediately west of St. Louis. They could block expansion into the interior of Louisiana Territory because they were situated on the Missouri uh, River, the Arkansas River, and, and the Red River, basically. And uh, so this uh, weak position that Jefferson talked about was not new because the French and the Spanish had experienced it for over 125 years. Now, Osage culture is pretty sophisticated and complex. We, uh, there's a lot of things we don't know, but there's a lot that we do know about old Osage culture. We could have a week-long seminar about it. Uh, <laughs> definitely. Uh, and diplomatic relations between the Osage and the Spanish in Louisiana were just as complex and delicate as any modern day uh, re international relationship situation. Now politically, the Osage were divided uh, originally into two bands. There were the, the uh, Utsita, the Little Osage up on the Missouri River. They were the down below people. And Utsita means below the hill. They lived below the hill and, and the French interpreted that sign language is little. Well, they weren't little. Then there were the big Osage uh, down on the Osage River. They were the Pahatsi, the people that live on the hills. So when they made that symbol, the French goes, oh, they're big Osage. Well, then in the latter part of the 18th century, there were some breakaways from the big Osage that settled 
uh, in the Neosho Verdigree Arkansas River of Oklahoma, and they became the Sansukti, the Osage of the Oaks, or more commonly called uh, the Arkansas Osage. Now, even though the three bands were somewhat independent of each other, they could band together for uh, mutual defense. In fact, the Osages were one of the few people, uh, native peoples, that could marshal all of their tribal resources, warriors, on a single target. And uh, Osage elder uh, Jim Redcorn explained this military capability. He said, the war movement was the largest act of war by the Osage tribe. Following a 10-day ceremony of preparation, warriors advanced in groups of 100 and fought by clans. The war movement was led by the Black Bear and Panther clans, and all the clans of the tribe participated in the war movement. At the peak of their power, the Osage could muster 2,000 warriors for battle. And once the movement had started, it was almost impossible to halt the inflamed warriors. And in talking about Osage culture like this, it'll, it'll help you understand a little bit how they related to the Spanish and why certain things happened uh, the way they did. Now beginning in the 1680s, uh, the Osage were coming down into the Illinois country and visiting Jesuit missions. And they were doing this not for spiritual enlightenment, but because trade centers were growing up around the missions. They wanted the metal knives, the axes, but especially the guns that the French had to offer. These things made life much, much easier. Uh, in return, the French wanted two resources from the Osage. Furs, which were in demand in Europe for clothing, and they also wanted slaves as laborers for their Caribbean sugar plantations. Well, the Osages, took captives in war for generations, and Osages had been taken captive and adopted into other tribes. And uh, most of the people that were captured were young people or women, and they were adopted to replace lost relatives. The concept of slavery, where one person works to support the lifestyle of another, was unknown uh, to the Osage. However, the French offering trade goods made slave raiding very lucrative and profitable. So the Osage went out on the Great Plains and raided the Paducah, the Plains Apache, and the Pawnees. And in fact, in Osage, Pawnee has come to mean slave. Uh, the Jesuit priests in Illinois were horrified by the slave trade but they unsuccessfully combated the traitors who incited it. Now officially, uh, the central government in Paris banned the Indian slave trade because they wanted peace among all the Indian tribes so the fur trade would not be disrupted and so that they could counter any British moves in North America. But the colonial officials were getting their cut of the trade and it was real easy to ignore edicts that were made 5,000 miles away. Now, the Osage had a dualistic view of the universe, and this is reflected in their governmental structure, even how they set up their villages. They saw balance and harmony in the universe, and everything was paired. For example, day and night, winter and summer, war and peace. And in their village schematics like this, you saw uh, the villages were divided in two on the east-west path of the sun. On the north side of the village were the Zishu division, the Sky Clans, and the civil leadership of the tribe came from the Sky Clans. Then on the south side were the Hunka, the Earth People. The war leaders came out of the Hunka. Now that didn't mean that they did not participate in civil negotiations. That did not mean that the Zishu did not participate in war. It just meant that the leaders came out of those two sections of the tribe. And also in, the, uh, uh, in, in matters that affected the tribe, uh, they had what they called the symbolic man. Once there was a council and decide what to do, if the symbolic man faced east, 
then the tribe was for peace because east was the direction of the rising sun. Uh, light, it was the beginning of light in the new day. If the symbolic man faced west, that was the direction of war because that was the setting of sun and darkness, the end of life. So you see there's that balance, that pairing going on east, west, north, south, even, even in their village structure. Well, uh, the, uh, the leader, there was a hereditary chief of the Zishu, the Zishu. Basically, you would call him a peace chief. And then there was a, a, a Hunka Gahiga, basically a war chief. And those, those were the two guys that uh, more or less had the influence over uh, the tribe. Now, Osage chiefs led by example uh, if their people did not agree with them, uh, they could walk off and form their own village and ignore them. And that happens periodically in Osage history. Europeans, on the other hand, came to believe that chiefs were like European monarchs, that their word was law, and of course it wasn't. So this resulted in a lot of diplomatic misunderstandings. Now the real power of the Osage nation didn't lie with the chiefs. It, it lay with the Nanhanjinga, the little old men. Uh, these are some of the last of the little old men here. There's pictures were taken about 1900. Uh, they were not little, they were not necessarily old, and they were not always men. But they were the wisest, brightest people of the tribe, and they were the uh, deliberative body that gave directions to the chief. They also led all the ceremonies. Uh, they possessed the ceremonial knowledge that governed every facet of Osage life. Uh, whites did not even know of their existence until the middle of the 19th century. They were so low profile and so low key and everybody thought well we're dealing with the chiefs and really you were dealing with the little old men. They were always looking out for the best interests of the Osage people, and the Nahanjinga became highly skilled at pitting the French, the British, the Spanish, and Americans all against each other. Now Europeans characterized the Osage as bloodthirsty, wanton murderers, and savages. But in that dualistic concept that I talked about, Death brought disharmony and imbalance to the universe. So for an Osage to kill somebody, there had to be a, a justification for it. They just couldn't kill wantonly. Uh, ceremonies, as Jim uh, Redcorn said, there's a 10-day ceremony for war preparation. Any action the Osages took that could result in death had to have ceremonial preparation to maintain balance in the universe. Now, Osage warriors boasted of their prowess in war, and a successful war party was celebrated when they returned, but those warriors had to undergo a purification ceremony before they could re-enter the village. And they also had to mourn for their slain enemies as a show of respect. So that maintained this balance in the universe. They killed somebody, but they also mourned for them and went through that purification. And um, not every war honor that the Osage had, they had 13 Odon war honors, uh, not every one of them involved death. You know, of course there was like counting coups, simply touching an enemy, and then stealing a horse, and so forth and so on. Again, we could do a week-long seminar on that. Now, there was an Osage funeral custom uh, that was misinterpreted as an act of war. Upon the death of a relative, clan members would blacken their face and set out from the village. They would kill and scalp the first non-Osage that they met, and they would place this scalp in the uh, grave of their deceased. Now, they believed that the road to the spirit world crossed, it was the Milky Way and that that was a long and lonely journey from Earth into the spirit world. And so to the Osage way of thinking, it was a great honor for their victim to escort their kinsmen into the spirit world. 
Well, needless to say, this view is not shared by non-Osages. And there are a lot of reports of Osage war parties uh, were actually funeral parties, mourning parties. They would blacken their face, the hunka would have a red gash on the right side of their cheek, the zishu would have a red gash on the left side of their, their cheek. So basically you did not want to be around an Osage male who had black paint on. It was not generally a healthy thing. Uh, the Nanhanjinga, as I said, possessed sacred knowledge to conduct the ceremonies. Each one of them had a small piece of the ceremony. Nobody knew all the ceremonies. Uh, each one contributed to that, and that included the preparations for war. Now, an Osage elder I know, Everett Waller, he described Osage culture this way. He said, I would say that in layman's terms, we were a war society and used the elements of the animals, the other environments, and even the actual wind, the days, the time, the heat, and the cold. Now, as I said, warriors boasted of their prowess, and young men attained social status through warfare, but sometimes they got out of hand. Now, in Oklahoma, there is a creek, Pond Creek, that was once called Poor Pawnee Creek, and a group of Osage young men found and killed a sick and emaciated Pawnee on that creek. Well, there was no honor in killing a sick, defenseless man. And the tribe was so ashamed by this action that every time anybody passed by the grave of this Pawnee, they put a stone on the grave as, as a symbol of respect and homage. And it eventually, over the generations, built up a huge rock cairn. And if you can beat the brush and go back to Pond Creek, you can actually find that rock cairn there. It's huge. Uh, so the uh, Osage uh, allowed certain traders into their village, not just anybody. You had to sort of prove yourself uh, to them. Traders who were caught trying to go to other tribes beyond the Osage were robbed, whipped, and sent back to the settlements. And the message was, you can come trade with us, but no one else. Uh, the Osage wanted to position themselves as middlemen between the French on the Mississippi and the Plains tribes on the west. And especially they wanted to limit the number of guns that their, uh, the people to the west of them uh, could get. Uh, the French, uh, now, in the, the situation with a hunter or a trapper was different. If they, they were caught trespassing on Osage land, they were killed because, as far as the Osage were concerned, uh, they were thieves, they were stealing our food, they were stealing our furs. You know, same way a farmer might react if he catches somebody rustling his cattle type of a thing. And that was uh, their view. Well, the French officials tended to uh, overlook these robberies or the death of hunters uh, because they did not want to jeopardize the fur trade, the slaves, and the military assistance that the Osage provided. There's a number of time Osage warriors uh, helped the French in uh, dealing with other, other tribes. And this detente, this system of detente between the French and the Osage worked pretty well between 1690 and 1763. Well, the end of the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, uh, resulted, of course, in the surrender of the Illinois country to uh, Great Britain and the cession of uh, Louisiana territory to Spain. Now, I won't get into Carl Eckberg's recent thing that Laclede and Choteau did not found St. Louis, uh, but I will tell you, you know, say Pierre Laclede and his stepson Auguste Chateau did establish a trading post at St. Louis in February of 1764. And the prosperity of St. Louis, the economic well-being, was contingent on its relations with the Osage Nation from its beginning. And uh, eventually the Osages came to call St. Louis Chateau Tuan, which means Chateau's town. 
So they obviously had a, a big influence. Now Laclede, uh, the Osage called Laclede their father. And he called them his children. Now, modern Americans, we would view this, well, that's kind of condescending and demeaning language, but the Osage were a patrilineal and patriarchal society, so fatherhood had a very special endearing meaning to them, even if it was symbolic. And the Osage expected their father to uh, <clears throat> nurture his children, and that was he was going to show them generosity with gifts, going to show them respect, and he was going to look out for their welfare in matters of trade. This reflected the Osage relationship to Wakanta, the creator, uh, who in his sight, the Osage called themselves the little ones, denoting their humility and their dependence before Wakanta, the, traitor, uh, the creator. Now Spain, of course, once Spain acquired Louisiana. They did not immediately come in to administer the territory. The local Frenchmen remained in positions of, govern of governance. Well, the Osage relationship in this situation continued to be one of congeniality. Uh, many St. Louis merchants and traders had an Osage spouse. Sexual intercourse signified the intercourse of commerce. And these traders built family relations within the tribe to help establish commercial rela relations. And today, on the uh, uh, Osage tribal rolls, there are descendants of the Chotos and several other trader families uh, today. The, uh, by the way, by this time, the Indian slave trade, which had been dwindling for years, was completely outlawed, halted when the Spanish took over administration in 1767. Now generosity was and still is a common Osage practice and visiting dignitaries to Osage villages were given feasts, clothing, blankets, horses with a great deal of ceremony. In this painting by George Catlin in 1832 it's depicting a similar uh, a reception among the Sioux. Uh, now, if you went to an Osage village and openly admired an object, that meant it was going to be given to you. Uh, and uh, my wife has had experience with that. Uh, the Osages expected the same kind of hospitality and generosity when they visited St. Louis. Now, the French understood this practice and they accommodated it. Spanish officials, however, found the practice tedious, irritating, and costly to their treasury. And the gen generosity that the Spanish showed towards the Osage was also linked to uh, whenever the funds were sent from St. Louis, or to St. Louis from New Orleans. Uh, often the subsidy for Upper Louisiana now called Spanish Illinois, fell short and arrived very irregularly, which did not set well with the Indians. Uh, the Osages viewed the Spanish as miserly and stingy, and indeed, many of the officials were. Uh, Governor General Antonio de Uloa, one of his first acts as governor of Louisiana was to ban traders from visiting Indian villages in 1768 as a cost-saving measure to the treasury. Well, <laughs> hundreds of in angry Indians uh, poured into St. Louis, and Captain Francisco Ruiz Ye Morales, he tried to hold councils with them to explain the situation, but they would just walk out on him. Uh, the Little Osage and the Missourias threatened reprisals against St. Louis for this show of disrespect. Captain Rue finally ordered merchandise to be given to the Indians and he let the governor know that his actions had prevented a war. And Spanish and Osage relations continued to plummet from there. Well, uh, Luis de Unzaga became governor of Louisiana in 1770, and he observed that the English 
have been courting the Little Osage and Missourias for several years with excessive presence. The Os Little Osage and Missouri were emboldened by the very weak policies of Spain and the fact that they could get trade goods from the British in Illinois. They were going down to Fort Chart and getting trade goods, which the British trade goods generally were a little better quality than the Spanish trade goods. Um, the Little Osage also robbed traders that, on the Missouri River, and they routinely raided St. Louis for horses. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Pedro Piernas reported in 1772 that he could not do anything to curtail the actions of the Little Osage in Missouri. Well, this impotent response encouraged the Little Osage in Missouri to break into Fort San Carlos, just outside of St. Louis, in July of 1772. Uh, they assaulted the soldiers on duty and stripped the post of its ammunition and provisions. The Indians then entered St. Louis, menaced the inhabitants, and raised a British Union Jack in the public square. Well, the citizens rallied and they tore down the flag. Now, this may have been part of what the Osage call a bluff war, and this is a, a Zishu division man in bluff paint, which is red and yellow, and Hunka would have had the reverse color. It would have been mostly yellow with the red on the chin. Uh, and bluff warfare, the objective was to obtain to obtain the objectives of warfare without killing anybody if you could do that. Uh, if, I, I think if the Indians had actually been part of a war movement, they would have killed the soldiers and they would have just killed people in St. Louis, but they didn't do that. Uh, well, while a party of Potawatomi and Ojibwa showed up in St. Louis while the Little Osage were still camped nearby, the two groups got into a fight, and two of the Osage chiefs were killed, and a third had his arm severed. Uh, the Osage retreated into St. Louis, and ironically were given protection by the very Spanish troops that they had assaulted earlier. Uh, uh, now, Lieutenant Governor Pernas decided uh, that he was not going to uh, uh, retaliate against the Indians for fear that it would start a war. Uh, but he did decide to suspend all trade with the Little Osage in Missouri for their offense. But at the same time, he expressed concern that that action was going to lead to a real war. Well, Governor Inzaga wrote to Pyrrhus on August the 21st, 1772, and he said, there is no other remedy than their extermination, referring to the Osages, since the tolerance which we have had with them, instead of attracting them, has made them insolent. It is clear that the time has arrived when this wrong demands this last sad remedy. But we are not in a position to apply it because we lack people and supplies, and lastly, because of the expense. So basically, Unzaga drew a line in the sand that he could not defend. Now, the big Osage, down on the Osage River, were remaining peaceable towards St. Louis and trading uh, at St. Louis. Uh, they were, however, taking out their resentment and frustration with the Spanish by raiding the Arkansas District and the Natchitoches District and disrupting uh, their trade. In uh, December of 1772, uh, Governor Inzaga authorized Lieutenant Governor de Mazir at Natchitoches to completely destroy the Osage. And he added that the extermination should take place without cost to the royal treasury. Well, again, he negated his very own policy. And this was a constant problem that the Spanish had in Louisiana. They tried to bend the will of the Osage to theirs, but they lacked the resources to either pacify them or to militarily subjugate them. 
Well, in October of 1772, a British licensed trader, uh, John Ducharme, slipped two boatloads of merchandise up the Missouri River to the Little Osage in Missouri a village up in uh, present-day Saline County. Uh, now, totally unaware of this, Pierinus wrote to Hugh Lord, the commandant of British Illinois at Fort Chart, and he said, in 1773, and he said, it is advisable to inform you that since certain tribes of the Missouri district, among others, those of the Little Osage and Missourias, having committed repeated attacks, even murders among the inhabitants of my jurisdiction, I decided to deprive them of every sort of supply by not sending them a single trader so that I might bring them to conciliation. Now, I think that Hugh Lord must have laughed when he read this letter knowing that one of his traders was up there operating right now. Now, when Perinus finally learned that Ducharme was up there trading with the Indians, he became unhinged. And Perinus dispatched uh, Laclede at the head of a hundred militiamen in canoes armed with swivel guns to arrest Ducharme. Now, March 11th, the uh, uh, militia proceeded upriver, but March the 11th, they made camp on Isla del Bui island of the bull just above present-day Washington. Uh, <clears throat> Ducharme's men came around the bend of the river, saw the militia there camped on the river. They landed on the opposite side and set up defensive positions. Uh, they had an exchange of gunfire and Ducharme uh, left the scene, fled the scene, leaving his furs and his men behind to be captured by the Spanish militia. A little Osage warrior with the group fled and went home and told everybody the Spanish are coming in a great navy. Well, um, this strong military response by Laclede made a big impression on the Osage. Now the big Osage, they negotiated a truce with uh, uh, St. Louis that lasted for at least five years without any trouble. Um, du Ducharme, <clears throat> or Pierinus, encouraged uh, the Sac, the Fox, the Iowa, the Potawatomi to go against the Little Osage and the Missourias, and this caused them to temporarily uh, leave the Missouri River and go down and camp near the Big Osage. Well, the Big Osage refused to aid their kinsmen. They said, you need to go to St. Louis and make everything right. Says, we're getting along fine with the Spanish. We're trading, and we don't want to mess that up. Uh, so the Little Osage and the Missourias went down and concluded a treaty in August of 1773 by smoking the pipe, and they were given gifts uh, by Lieutenant Governor Pernas. Now, Governor Inzaga, uh, correctly predicted that the peace was only going to be valid for the St. Louis district. And he was absolutely right. In Osage thinking, we made peace with St. Louis, but Arkansas Post and Natchitoches are still on the target list. St. Louis merchants uh, were happy once the trade with the Little Osage and the Missouri is resumed. It didn't bother them one bit that they were going down and killing their competitors at Arkansas Post and Natchitoches. In November of 1777, Lieutenant Governor Francisco Cruzat, the new Lieutenant Governor, reported that the Big Osage provided St. Louis with 553 packs of animal skins, the Little Osage produced 154 packs, and the Missouri is 90 packs. That was a grand total of about 80,000 pounds of skins, or 40 tons. And this accounted for 60% of the fur trade profits in St. Louis that year, and that was a figure that was fairly consistent, 40 to 60% for about the next three decades. 
Well, in 1779, the little Osage in the Missouri resumed horse stealing in St. Louis. The citizens uh, were getting so annoyed because there were so few horses that they could even uh, plow. Uh, so they petitioned uh, Go Lieutenant Governor Fernando Leba, new Lieutenant Governor, uh, to stop the plundering, uh, but he delayed sending this petition on to, Saint to New Orleans. Now, instead, he pardoned the Big Osage for murdering three hunters on the Arkansas River the previous year, 1778, and he called it an old matter. He hoped that the Big Osage would reciprocate with good behavior themselves. Now, Spanish officials, much like the French, regarded the hunters on the Arkansas Post to be low-life scum. Uh, <clears throat> And they tolerated the death of those hunters as long as the citizens of the St. Louis district were not harmed. Um, the, so this pattern was established. The Osage and St. Louis were basically getting along and trading with one another. Uh, the Osage would kill white hunters trespassing in the Ozarks and Wichita Mountains and they would disrupt the trade of Natchitoches and Arkansas Post by their raiding. Uh, then after an incident would happen in one of those places they would appear in St. Louis and offer contrition and apologies. Officials in St. Louis would give them gifts and forgive them, hopefully to prevent trouble from coming to St. Louis. And I believe that the little old men their, this was part of their machinations and that they always seemed to know just how far they could go in pushing the Spanish without suffering serious repercussions. Now, Leibaugh uh, finally sent that petition along to New Orleans and Governor Bernardo Galvez immediately suspended all trade to the Little Osage and Missourias. Well, the merchants of St. Louis pleaded that this action would financially ruin them. But Galvez persisted in his order. And the Little Osage in Missouri had made a truce with the Iowa Indians north of the Missouri River. Uh, the Iowas were now middlemen for British traders coming down out of Canada. So the Little Osage, Missouri got what they needed from the Iowa or they continued the practice of robbing traders on the Missouri going to other tribes. Uh, Galvez, when he found out that the British had set up uh, trading posts in the Iowa villages, uh, ordered uh, efforts to evict them, but those efforts turned out to be so feeble that the Indians and the uh, British traders alike just laughed them out of the village. Well, the Osage and Missourias uh, did not participate in the May 18th, or May 8th, 1780 uh, British-led attack on St. Louis. They set that one out. Uh, little Osage Chief Le Balafre, the Scar, he appeared in St. Louis on June the 28th under a flag of truce. Now, Lieutenant Governor uh, Lebas had been ill and he died the very day that the chief appeared in St. Louis. Acting Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Francesco Cartabona, uh, arrested Lebalafre for horse stealing. A few days later, the chief tried to escape by attacking uh, one of the jailers and Le Balafre was held in jail for 40 days and his wife was eventually permitted to join him. Now the official report states that one day uh, Le, Le Balafre kneed his wife in the chest, took a knife she was carrying, stabbed her twice in the throat and once in the chest. And he grabbed a musket and tried to hit a soldier over the head with it. The commotion roused the garrison and Le Balafre fought as, quote, one who does not look to his life, unquote. Well, he was subdued and tied up, and three days later, his wife died. For the next six days, he refused food and drink 
uttering a thousand oaths and making great threats in the name of his nation and injuring his face and all his body by striking himself against the floor and wall. This caused his death more than any mistreatment which he received. That's the official Spanish report. Three days later, he died from these self-inflicted injuries. Well, Francisco Cruzat was reappointed lieutenant governor on September 24th, several weeks after La Balafre's death. And he filed the official report of this incident on November the 10th. Now, Lieutenant Cartabona probably had far less diplomatic skill with the Indians than even the very inept governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor Leyva did. Uh, this arrest could have been a bad judgment on Cartabona's part, or it just may have been a general sense of we're going to pay back the little Osage for stealing horses in general, um, we don't know. Uh, con the, the part that mystifies me is the death of his wife. Now, contrary to European belief, Osage spouses did love and nurture each other. And she allegedly was not a prisoner. She was there uh, of her own free will. So the question to me comes up is, did Balafre snap? Osages did fear imprisonment worse than death. So did he snap or did the soldiers abuse them which sent him into a rage and that actually his wife was killed by the soldiers? We don't know. We only have the Spanish report and of course they exonerate themselves. Uh, the little Osage shortly thereafter arrived in St. Louis to greet Cruzat and welcome him back as Lieutenant Governor. He was surprised at their lack of outrage over the death of their chief. And I think it's very likely that the Nanhanjinga, the little old men, had calculated the potential cost of retaliation and decided against it. Now, following the American Revolution, um, see, there's Cruzat. Uh, following the American Revolution, Spanish Illinois faced threats on three fronts. The British in the north, the Americans in the east, and the Osage and Missourias on the west. Now the fear of the Osage was so strong that the death of just one European sent all of the settlements into a panic. Uh, the Osages followed the same old pattern. They would uh, show contrition and promise good behavior in exchange for some gifts. The Spanish wanted the Osage and Missouri as allies against the British and against American expansion, but they failed miserably in all their conciliatory attempts. So this cycle of confrontation and mollification through gifts was just repeated over and over and over. Now finally, the Spanish thought, well, Let's create a buffer between some of our settlements and the Osage. And the Shawnee and the Delaware, who were enemies of the Osage, were invited to settle uh, in Spanish Illinois. And in 1787, Louis Lormer was given a grant and about 1,500 Shawnee and Delaware settled in this area. But I don't think they turned out to be as good a buffer as Spain had hoped. On March the 7th, 1790, Lieutenant Governor Manuel Perez summed up Osage-Spanish relations in, in a letter to Governor Esteban Miro. He said, the Osages are the worst two tribes, the big and little Osages, that we have on the Missouri, and at the same time, the strongest, the more so if they unite. For this reason, it is necessary to temporize with them to some extent, handle them as tactfully as possible in order to restrain their excesses, as the few forces in this country do not permit anything else. So once again, Perez was attempting to control the Osage through a trade embargo. Well, the big Osage just robbed traders on the Missouri River. 
But there are suspicions that the traders were actually ignoring the trade ban, trading with the Osages, and then coming back claiming to have been robbed by the Osage. Then Perez took his action a step further. On May the 4th, 1792, he wrote to Governor Carondelet. He said, I have done all I could to excite the Sacs and Renards, the Fox Indians, to go to war with them, the Osage Indians. At my request, several parties have gone into their country, and at this moment, I learn that one such party has returned after killing five persons. Uh, Francisco Luis Hector de Carondelet, Governor General in New Orleans, issued orders to annihilate the Osage, or at the very least, make, drive them further west. Once again, the St. Louis merchants and traders protested the government's action as financially ruinous to them. However, uh, <clears throat> the governor took the added step of suspending all trade on the Missouri River for fear that the Osages would simply rob any traders and, or that traders would ignore the bans. Now Spain was officially at war with the Osage and they tried to gather a grand army of Indian mercenaries from eastern tribes but once again limited funding and supplies caused the plan to fall apart. Lieutenant Governor Pierre Trudeau wrote to Carondelet in April of 1793. He said, I can assure your excellency there are no nations in these territories who are not at war with the Osages, but with all, one does not see any of them killing more than two Osages in a year. They will never succeed in destroying them. Well, uh, the continual harassment uh, by the Sac, Fox, Iowa, and Potawatomi, and Kickapoo, eventually forced the uh, uh, Little Osage and the Missourias to withdraw from the Missouri River permanently. Uh, the Missourias bore the worst brunt of it. They were nearly annihilated in an attack by the Sac and Fox, and part of them joined the Little Osage, and they moved down to the vicinity of the Big Osage, the other part of the Missouri survivors moved upriver to join the Oto. And, uh, <clears throat> however, the Osa and, and, and in response to this, the Osages did not initiate a grand war movement against the Spanish settlements. Uh, really, they, they didn't need to because they were content to just steal horses in the settlements carry on trade with rogue traders, and they continued to pick off the hunters and trappers venturing into their territory. The only real casualty of the Spanish Osage War was the economy of St. Louis. And Augustin Pierre Chateau took steps to undo Carondelet's uh, harmful actions uh, to the local commerce. In April of 1794, Auguste Chateau took six Osage leaders to New Orleans to negotiate peace with Governor Carondelet. He convinced the governor that if he and his brother Pierre received a monopoly on the Osage trade, they could stop the raids. Well, the Chateaus knew the Osage as well. They were married into the big Osage tribe as well. Now, they received a six-year contract in May of 1794. On the return trip to St. Louis, the Osages were walking along the bank of the Mississippi when they were ambushed by Chickasaws. Three of their leaders, including a chief called Juan Lafon, who was the Hunkagahiga, the war, the war chief, was killed in this ambush. Well, the remaining Osages decided to go overland to avoid that trouble again. And there was a fear that Spain would be, the Spanish would be blamed for this incident and that it would fuel a war with the Osage. Well, uh, the Commandant of Arkansas Post let it slip that the Osages were trying to get home overland instead of by river. The Chickasaws caught wind of that, pursued the group, and they captured their interpreter. Uh, word finally reached St. Louis that the remaining Osages had gotten home safely 
and that they blame the Chickasaw and not the Spanish for the incident, much to the relief of uh, the merchants and traders in St. Louis. However, they were not so happy when they found out the Chotos now had a trade monopoly with the Osages. Well, in September, several hundred Osages arrived in St. Louis to trade, and they exhibited a, quote, docile and friendly demeanor that absolutely amazed Lieutenant Governor Trudeau. In the spring of 1795, the Chotos built Fort Carondelet down on the uh, Meridassane, the place of many swans near their villages with their own money. Um, Osage raids stopped in Spanish Illinois and the furs flowed into the warehouses of St. Louis once again. Now, officials also attempted to broker a peace between the Caddo's out on the plains and uh, the Osages, and a Caddo chief uh, told the commandant of Nachitokas, he says, we have no faith in what the Osages say. He, they are liars. They may make peace with the Spaniards, but not with us. It's not the first time. So Spain's efforts to generally make peace were also being undermined because the Chickasaws and uh, Choctaws were crossing in uh, to the territory and clashing with the Quapaw, the Cato, and the Osage. So Spain just had a big mess trying to bring about a general uh, peace. Now, some of the big Osages were dissatisfied that Pierre Choteau recognized Pahuska here, white hair, as a large metal chief. Uh, the government was prone to give uh, different people medals, and, and a large medal or a small medal viewed upon their importance. Um, this kind of undermined the traditional tribal government structure. So the Os some of the Osages resented the fact that Pierre gave Whitehair a big medal when he had been a small medal chief. Yeah. Uh, this action virtually meant that the Spanish were recognizing Whitehair as the head chief over all the Osages. And these government chiefs, these so-called government chiefs, often bypassed the hereditary chiefs and the little old men and this created more political division within the tribe. Uh, Choteau's act essentially denied this uh, arrow going home, uh, also known as Town Maker and Claremont. This is actually his son, Claremont II. Uh, it denied him his position as hereditary Zizu Gahiga. And Claremont and his followers moved to the Verdigree River uh, where some other dissident Osages had settled as early as 1786. And these dissidents uh, had resented Spanish meddling in tribal politics. Uh, the son of Juan Lafon, who was killed by the Chickasaws, Koshi Sigra, makes tracks far away, also known as Big Track, was the Hunkagahiga. Well, he soon joined in the exodus uh, and the Arkansas Osage basically were maintaining the traditional tribal leadership structure. Well, in March of 1797, some Bear Clan members of the Arkansas Osage came up here to St. Genevieve, stole some horses, they found a man out on the commons working in a field, and they killed him. Uh, Commandant Francois Vallée dispatched the militia to evacuate some Americans who had settled out on the Big River. Uh, <clears throat> Governor Carondelet began to question the Chotos about their ability to keep, uh, keep the Osage at peace. Pierre assured the governor that there were still five or six hundred big Osage warriors under white hair who were still abiding by the peace. Well, in 1798, Lieutenant Governor Trudeau acknowledged that the Osages had been harmful on the Arkansas River, but he said, they leave the important district of Illinois in peace, which is beginning to be settled by large immigration of foreigners, and the foreigners were Americans. Um, however, when Pierre Chateau was absent from Fort Clont Carondelet, uh, the big and little Osage would come up here and steal horses. Um, the situation was worse in the South, though. Uh, Felix Trudeau at Natchitoches wrote, 
There is no year in which these accursed Osages do not kill some of the hunters of this post or Arkansas post. Well, the very same, uh, um, in January of 1800, uh, the Osages stole some horses at St. Genevieve and at the Merrimack settlement just south of St. Louis. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Carlos de Hall de la Sue wrote a letter to Chief Whitehair berating him and his children and demanding that the stolen horses be returned. Uh, he, <clears throat> excuse me, in March, two Americans were killed and a third one was wounded at the Merrimack settlement. Uh, Pierre Chateau learned that the raiders were Arkansas Osage and he informed de la Sue he said, I am going to do my utmost to have the murderer turned over to me, but I cannot assure you that I shall succeed because the chief, meaning Pahuska, has no longer any authority over them. They do not recognize him anymore, and therefore he cannot be responsible for anything. So even though the Arkansas Osage did not view Whitehair, Pahuska as their chief. The Spanish still had this idea that he's chief of uh, all the Osages. Well, in February of 1800, the Kickapoo went to war with the Little Osages, and they returned to St. Louis with 45 scouts and five prisoners. Uh, the Kickapoo raid brought some relief to the Spanish settlements because uh, the Little Osage kind of laid low for a period of time. Um, Whitehair was actually not opposed to a military defeat of the Arkansas or the Little Osage. He believed that uh, it, they, they would come to their senses and rejoin the Big Osage, in other words, acknowledge his leadership. Uh, De La Sue asked Governor uh, Casa Calvo in New Orleans not to deprive the Osage of traitors as it would do damage to the good and obedient members of the nation, and he estimated that it would diminish the profits in St. Louis by at least a third. Well, Whitehair presented the partisan of the Merrimack raid to De La Sue, and he said, my father, after having wept for much time because those of my tribe have acted against your children, I have at last been able to bring the partisan of those who came last year to kill your children. Now, at a council, Le Chenier, a chief of the Arkansas Osage, spoke of his desire to reunite with the Big Osage, but he emphasized that the young men would not listen to him, and he was probably correct. De La Sue berated the Osages as traitors and murderers and he put this warrior in chains, which of course is a fate worse than death. The next day he advised the Osages that he was banning all trade and that he was going to punish Pierre Chateau by sending him away to New Orleans. And that was really more of a ruse kind of a thing to get some leverage on him. And then Pierre rebu rebuked the Osages for lying to him. Well, Lachere and Whitehair made speeches of contrition, and De La Sue promised to release the partisan if the Arkansas band would go back and rejoin the Big Osage. He used the stick. Now he used a carrot. He distributed 100 muskets, 100 pounds of powder, and 300 pounds of balls as gifts. The Osage remained passive for several months, but the two bands never reunited. The partisan grew ill in jail, and fearing retaliation if he died, De La Sue handed him over to the Chotos to nurse back to health. As soon as he got well, he fled and went back home. Now in 1802, Manuel Lisa acquired the trade monopoly for the Big Osage. The Chotos were a little miffed, and they abandoned Fort Carondelet and they set up shop at the Three Forks, where the Verdigree, the Neosho, and the Arkansas River all come together. Uh, so they went down to carry on trade with the Arkansas Osage, who basically went there to begin with because of Choteau's actions with Whitehair. Uh, well, more of the Big Osage, who were loyal 
uh, to the Choteau family, left the Big Osage, and went down to the Arkansas as well. So the tribe was really, leadership was being split apart, and this kept the Osages from presenting a united front, and it would affect their uh, relations with the Americans later on. Uh, the United States, of course, you know, Louisiana passed back to France, but it did not affect the Osages and their relationship with the locals. Uh, when the United States acquired Louisiana in 1803, the Chotos soon found themselves as intermediaries uh, between the tribe and the American government. And the American relationship of the Osage with the Americans, of course, was going to be different than anything they had experienced with either the French or the Spanish. Trade became connected to land sessions by treaties. Uh, before their first treaty in 1808, we know the Osage basically controlled everything from the Mississippi to the Central Plains, from the Missouri to the Red River. Uh, in just 17 years, by 1825, all they had left was a reservation 50 miles wide and 150 miles long in southern Kansas. That's how fast the frontier was changing and just how fast their land loss was. So, in conclusion, uh, St. Louis was dependent on the fur trade uh, with the Osage. Uh, from its beginning, and the Osages provided anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the town's profit. Now for 40 years, nearly 40 years, the relationship between Spanish St. Louis and the Osage ranged from one of trade to trepidation. Uh, the Osages took actions to protect their territory, their resources, and their culture. And the Spanish generally interpreted these actions as disobedience to their policies. And these two gentlemen here, uh, Shinkawasa, Handsome Bird, and uh, Moshon Akita Tonka, big soldier here, uh, they were leaders in the latter years of the Spanish regime and the early years of the American regime. And their portraits remind us who the real masters of Upper Louisiana were. Despite claims to dominance and dominion over Louisiana, Spanish officials found out that in the Osage Quarter, they were indeed miserably weak. And that's it. Thanks for coming, Mike. All right, All right we're gonna take a 10-minute butt break and then we'll come back with, De with Deb Cambron. She's going to talk about the latrine hat, which is a hat that was found, yes, in a dugout outhouse. So in 10 minutes, take a break, and we'll come back. And then after Deb talks, we'll do a short roundtable with our speakers.